everything seems to be going. I put it in so that it's hard to get in there probably in the top. Oh, we're just muffled though. So what time do you think we should start? trying to buy enough time in case somebody comes at 9.30. Okay, well, I think it's going to be the 9 o'clock and anyone who responded, I start to see them. I responded to them and said, no, not yet. Steve was in charge. <laughs> we'll start, no, about, it's start in about five minutes. No, don't. Okay, Linda's going to help you. Anybody need me to repeat it? Yeah, one more time. One more time. 559-657-6840. Five, five, six, five, six, eight, eight. You go to your messages. Add that as a contact. Be careful. Sorry, Kelly. Good morning. You already have it in? I had it in. You must have texted me from it, I guess. Oh, yes, your reminders. Those yes. of you who have given us your cell phone number, your reminder comes from that number. Yep. Yeah. Just text the word here, H-E-R-E. Thank you. Great look at the shoes, Pastor Steve. I know, I was looking at like your shoes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. They just asked about that number. So. Okay. All right, I'm just going to All right. No, and you got a few more minutes, because I, I told them we were going to start in five. So since we sent out two different messages, one saying we were moving the service to 9.30, then when we decided we had to move outside, we stuck with 9 o'clock, and we were working to start at 9.15. <laughs> well, there was a message about that, yeah. that it was going to be 15 or 20 minutes. Yeah. So we're, we're, be patient with us. Every week is something new. We're just glad to be here. Yeah, that's we're it. glad you're here. I can't imagine what y'all are going through having to change everything every, every day. Every week is something new. Yeah. Which I know you all are dealing with in your own life, whether it's at work, at, at home, with family.
you are comfortable in the shade and the breeze is uh, blowing well enough, I did a, a funeral this week and discovered that it gets hot really quick after the 10 o'clock hour. So um, we will move right on through the service without too much haste, but we won't spend a lot of time for, for no reason also. Our announcements this morning are... Uh, You've already got the word on text the word live, right? Don't forget you can give uh, on our website at met by, by studymethodist.org. Click the giving tab. You can give uh, through the plates or... Um, that's it. That's it. <laughs> and, and we continue our healthy relationship series today. You're going to want to pay attention to your church email in the next week um, because we've had some changes that have kind of thrown things into a little bit of a disarray, so we'll be deciding for sure on the start time of the second service this week at staff meeting. Uh, with that said, if you'll bow your heads and join me in a word of prayer, we'll enter into worship reverend. Father, we give thanks for a glorious morning, for good company to be with, for the chance to listen to your word and to discern your spirit. We ask that you bless us as we worship today. We bring our hearts and our souls before you open and ready to be moved. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.
beautiful morning, beautiful wind. It's like God himself is bringing in his fresh winds on us, amen? So let's continue on in, in worship and have hearts that are open and surrendered to God and his goodness, amen? Because right now, we're nothing to help God's mercy, amen? So let's, let's just... Let's just give glory to him because he's so good to us. And if we think about it, every day is a new miracle. Amen. The, the, just the simple fact that God breathes his breath of life into our lungs every morning, that's his faithfulness. And how can we not just, how can we not praise him because of his faithfulness? Amen. So let's continue on in the worship.
I'll read to you from Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verses 22 through 33. Ladies, do not be offended by the first sentence. Listen to the whole thing. <laughs> Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Let me go over some things that uh, you have likely already experienced, and, and we'll just kind of lay down a baseline of common truth. So in the Christian faith, one of the things that, that we say is the first time that someone accepts the invitation to become a follower of Jesus, and they say in their heart, Father, forgive me uh, for my sins, and I promise to follow you. The language that we use is that they are then saved. Throughout my life, because I, I was saved in that big way uh, very early in life, throughout my life I have heard a variation of this. I thought you were a Christian. I can't believe you call yourself a Christian. And what people were pointing out was, though I claimed to be saved, I continued to sin. Not if you've ever had that experience. Maybe just me. If you were made perfect, I'd like you to preach next week. <laughs> when I became a pastor, it was redoubled. My family and, and uh, friends and other people would use the expression, I can't believe you're a pastor. And the truth is, me too. M many, many times I couldn't believe that I, I was a pastor. Here is what is actually happening in those scenarios. When you first give your life over to Christ, your intent is to give your whole life over to Christ and, and have all of your sins erased. And that's great. But human beings are created to incessantly change. And so after having taken the step of committing yourself to Christ, that process of sin and death and confession and repentance and being saved repeats itself over and over and over. It just isn't the primary time. So that in our lives as Christians, we're saved once, and then as a part of that salvation, we go on to discover more and more areas of our life that we have held back from giving to the service of God. And when we find out about that and, and reckon with it, then we are saved again in a new way because we offer another piece of who we have become to Christ. That really is the normative way of Christians to forever be in the process of continually being saved and redeemed from new area, areas of our life. Because that is a, a common experience and, and a common truth, it reflects well on what I want to talk about today. The underpavement of, of what I'll be talking about today relies on the same basic principle. Whoever it is that you marry, or conversely, whatever child you had, or conversely, whatever friend you have made that's a good and trusted friend, you will discover in your friendship or in your relationship with them that there are many times when they simply are not the person that they used to be. Sometimes we react negatively to that and, and think, well, I, I, I fell in love with the person that you were, but you're different now, and I don't know if I love that. Of course you don't. In a long-term, healthy relationship, you're going to need to fall in love all over again with different parts of the person that you have pledged your troth to. You're going to have to renew that love by seeing new things in them, discovering new things about yourself, because that's how we are. You are not the person they fell in love with. You are not the person you were when you were your parents' child. 
and your child or children are not the persons they were when they were small. We change constantly and we have to continue to refresh our love and our dedication to one another in the same way that we are continually being saved by our God. I, I hope that makes sense and I'm sure that it does. It makes us a little uncomfortable because it, it goes against common stupid myths. And, and our society, this is as political as I'll ever get, is full of common stupid myths right now. Look, blanket statements that try to sum up everything for a very long time are ridiculous. And, and it's true in our faith too. Yes, you, you are saved when you accept Christ, but it doesn't mean you're perfected. That's the process that happens after you take that initial step. You're saved over and over and over again from different aspects of your sin. In our relationships, you love the person you're with, but that person is going to change and you're going to have to learn to love them for the person they become. This is the way and the truth of kind of a nuanced understanding of life. So today I, I offer uh, five characteristics that we can bring into our relationships that will help us to continually renew our relationships and be mindful of this of evolution and the change that happens naturally in our relationships. The first one is both partners in a relationship need to have their primary relationship not with one another but with Christ. It goes against again the American mindset or the late Western uh, epic mindset which suggests that in another human being you will find all that you ever needed but it isn't true. If you expect your spouse or your friends or your children to be your Messiah to save you from your own misery and to be everything you need them to be you're setting them up to fail and yourself up for bitterness. You may expect those things of Jesus Christ. I just explained human beings change incessantly from birth to death. Be mindful of what scripture says about Christ. It's tremendously important. He is the same, unchanging. He never changes. Same today, tomorrow, and forever. You and I do better when we make the decision to relate to Christ as our primary source of how we feel, how we are, right? To give our lives to Christ and to see our relationships as a part and parcel of our service to Christ. Again, do the people in your life a kindness. If you're bitterly disappointed that they haven't turned out to be everything that a Messiah should be, you should put the right Messiah in that slot and let them be a human being in your relationship who is changing, evolving, and going to misstep along the way. It just makes for a better relationship. Offer your marriage and your friendship and your various relationships over to Christ, and you're in a much better place to find grace and to be able to give and to ask forgiveness and the essences of relationship. If you let another human being occupy that space, it's just going to be an unmitigated disaster. So the first characteristic of a long-term healthy relationship is that both partners in the relationship are trying to use the relationship as a way to serve Christ and a way to grow in their understanding of his teachings. Now we have a relationship, the relationship between a pastor and a congregation is actually very similar uh, to uh, uh, other relationships. And one of the ways that I have observed long-term pastors who are actually happy in the pastorate, one of the things that I, I have seen about them is they have this characteristic. They don't ever understand themselves just to be servants of the people of the church, uh, responding to every whim and desire that the people have for their pastor. They understand themselves to be pursuing a calling that Jesus has put on their hearts, and whatever church they're with or whatever situation they're in, they're pursuing that calling and it makes a significant difference in their ability to minister effectively over a long period of time and to grow in their ministry. So first things first, if your relationships are not what they should be uh, and you are firmly in the belief that it was the other person's fault, ask yourself seriously before you make that judgment, might it be your fault for expecting too much of another human being who has to be allowed to grow and to fail and to make mistakes along the way? serve Christ in your relationship and your relationship is stronger for it. The second characteristic is to be trustworthy and trusting. And man, is uh, that a hard one. Uh, I'm gonna speak plainly, I hope that it's not offensive to anybody, but in the modern world, 
human beings have at their disposal a multiple ways to have affairs in their uh, marriage relationships. We have uh, affairs of the heart that can be conducted using cell phone um, and proximity at work and, and other places. We, we have affairs of the, the heart and, and uh, uh, sickness of the soul through the use of pornography. We have the ability to carry on online affairs in chat rooms and, and other ways. And we also have uh, the ability, because of passwords, to keep those secrets secret. I am going to suggest that in your primary relationships, if you do that currently, if your spouse does not know your passwords and can't access your phone and your computer, you should change that. And you should have each other's passwords. And you should also have permission to check anytime you want to. If something stirs in your gut and, and, and you think there is something not right here and you want to go check to make yourself feel better, you should be allowed to go check. Marilyn and I conduct ourselves that way. And, and, and I will tell you, it's helpful in several ways. I've, I've never checked in Maryland because uh, I, I never had reason to, or never had the feeling to, but to know that I could anytime I started to feel vulnerable or, or uh, upset in some way is, is good for me in the relationship. And it's really good for me also to know she can check anytime she wants. I don't know that if she ever has. If she has, she didn't tell me, and I've given her no reason to, but she could. And that helps to check behavior, and it helps human beings stop temptation before temptation takes over. All of us, at some point, are tempted by the things that I have mentioned, and, and we have to be diligent about putting safeguards that help us to be our better selves. So I advocate strongly in our relationships, same thing with children and uh, other folks that you're in a close relationship with, that your electronic devices be open uh, for uh, perusal at any time that you desire. There is, of course, a great danger in that, uh, which is your accounts can be used in, in ways that you wouldn't want to use them if the marriage has really gone south, etc. But I think that the benefits outweigh the dangers because it is a sign of respect, it is a type of sacrifice, and it helps both the person who might do the checking and the person who, who might need help in not straying in a variety of ways. So in, in the modern age, more than ever, it's tremendously important to let your spouse know that you don't, you're not keeping secrets and you don't intend to keep secrets. Number three, a willingness to sacrifice for the relationship. So that, that goes with number two. Obviously, that's a, a type of sacrifice, but it's more than that. Here's a conversation that Marilyn and I had when, when we were busy falling in love the first time. She told me that uh, her family had been in, in and around the Central Valley for uh, several generations, and, and uh, they kind of felt like, please don't be offended, it, it was a kind of curse. They kept moving away and, and getting sucked back into it. And I laughed and laughed because I didn't know anything about the Central Valley. And I told her, well, aren't you lucky, right? You're going to marry me and we'll live in Colorado all of our life because my bishop is in Colorado and that's the only place they can appoint me. <laughs> well, when I told her the news, she didn't really, never said a word. She didn't bring it up again. She didn't tell me whether she was disappointed or whatever. But as we left the state of Colorado, the last lingering look that she gave to the Rocky Mountains told me fully. She is sacrificing uh, uh, deeply to make this move for the good of the marriage and for the good of, of the, the ministry. And I've never forgotten that. She loves uh, Visalia and, and living here, as do I. But in that moment, to her, it was a tremendous sacrifice to go back to where her family had been for so long. And, and I will tell you that when I am mindful of that sacrifice and, and thousands of others that she has made, it makes it much easier for me to return the sacrifice and to want to be the best husband that I can be. If you're in a relationship where that isn't true, where neither side really seems to be trying or going the extra mile or willing to, to uh, um, uh, forgive and, and be gracious, instead of thinking to yourself, I wish that I had a partner that was more forgiving and, and uh, more sacrificing and more gracious, be the partner who is more forgiving, more sacrificing, and more gracious because when we pursue our faith in our primary relationships, we teach other people how to do it, as well as we inspire and cause them to want to live in that same way in reaction. We serve Christ in ways that are very difficult for us because we're mindful of the great sacrifice he made for us. The same thing is true in our relationships. Number four, 
The fourth characteristic of a healthy relationship is the ability to forgive. Again, we talked about uh, we're always changing and growing, and, and um, we have to fall in love with each other over and over and over again. And the key to that, the, the key to the ability to fall in love with the person that you're married to now instead of some ghost of the past is the ability to forgive them. Forgive them for the wrong they've done. And if the truth be told, forgive them also for being a human being who changed on you when you didn't want it to be changed. You didn't want it to, to move in the direction uh, that they might have moved. If you can't let go of the past, then the future is predetermined. And the future it is uh, a battle with one another. It's resentment. It's anger. It, it is uh, eventually shame. And shame is the most toxic thing in a human life. The ability to forgive is a skill set. It is not that you have to be more spiritual than you are. It, it is not that you have to pray more than you do. It is not that you have to read your Bible more than you do. That When we think those kind of things to ourselves, well, I, I have to get uh, to be a better Christian in order to be able to forgive. Uh, and, and to do that, I have to do these things. It's not true. What you need is to talk with and be guided by someone who actually knows the steps of forgiveness, who knows how they play out, and knows uh, what the sign is that they're sinking deep into your heart and, and allowing real forgiveness to happen. And you need to follow the guidance of that person, taking those steps of forgiveness over and over again until they do take seed and begin to grow. And you'll find that the difference between actually taking the steps of forgiveness and, and being about the business of calling this skill set and getting good at it, um, the, the difference is that when you truly forgive in that way, you yourself find that you feel more forgiven by God, and you are refreshed. And if you don't do that, if you simply use it as a throwaway, I forgive you, but what you mean is I'm writing it down on that long list of stuff that I don't like about you, what you'll find is those things crowd in on you and cause you to be more and more angry at the other person, at yourself, at God, at the ways of the world, at all the wrong and injustice that has ever happened. That is the definition of hell, to be surrounded by the whole of your past without the ability to figure out how to just let it go so that you can be in the moment. In our church, we teach the four steps of forgiveness, and, and, and uh, we'll do that again soon. When we do that, I, I truly encourage you, even if you've been through the course before, to take the course and refresh yourself. The best gift that you can ever give your spouse or your children or your best friends is the ability to genuinely forgive and to love them after the sin as well and as thoroughly as you loved them before. The fifth characteristic, and you'll be glad to know that this is the uh, end of it. I, I am too, because the left side of my bald spot's warming up. <laughs> Affirmation. Affirmation is the soil in which good relationships grow. Absolutely. So there are five love languages. I, I, I know that. But you fill in the blanks for how you would give a person affirmation. Here's what happens when you affirm somebody, if you are creative with it and, and if you are uh, dedicated to it. You teach them day in and day out that they hold a special place in your heart and that you genuinely appreciate the good that they do. So the easiest affirmation to give is to say, uh, you look pretty today or you look handsome today. And, and that's a good starting point, a kind of a beginner's way of affirming. But I hope in your relationships that you really will be creative and learn to affirm well beyond physical beauty uh, or, or those kinds of things. If your spouse or children have good manners, uh, appreciate the good manners. If they are creative in a way that you are, appreciate that they are creative in a way that you are. Marilyn and, and uh, I uh, are actually pretty good practitioners of, of affirmation. And the reason is, and, and listen closely to this, because we're so radically different, right? We're both introverts. Other, other than that, we don't share a lot of characteristics. I don't see her differences as being something that I have to change so that she's more like me. I rejoice in them because her differences bring to the relationship stuff that I would never bring. She has an appreciation for beauty, an appreciation for art. She has an ability to look at situations and people in a, a immediately graceful way that I simply have never learned to possess. But her bringing that into the relationship makes me better in the relationship and better in general. And she expresses the same thing about me. 
she needs sometimes my ability to stand my ground and, and not be pushed around. She needs my ability to, to uh, occasionally make the decision to do something that is difficult and won't be popular because it's the right thing. And she compliments me on those things as I compliment her on the opposites. We affirm each other's basic character, we affirm each other's calling, and we affirm the differences that are brought into the relationship, even though sometimes those differences are the source of contention. If you want a better spouse, if you want a more appreciative child, if you want a better best friend, it, it's crazy, but a lot of that is in your hands. When you teach another human being that you have watched them, that you have studied them, that you understand them, and that you appreciate them for who and what they are, what you teach them is that you're safe and that you're a source of love, and you teach them literally to have the desire to do their best for you because we all work better for someone who loves us than for a taskmaster who forces us to do what we should do. We say of God, He's the great judge of eternity, but we leaven that immediately by the reminder he loves his creation above all else. And we constantly talk about the love of God because it's an affirmation that we need to hear so that we are made ready to serve him. Those five things and many more go into a healthy relationship. So I hope at least one of them spoke to you in, in a condition where maybe you could use some improvement or it's time to redouble your efforts and that you will be prayerful and, and earnest about that in the coming weeks, that you'll try to refresh yourself in that particular characteristic or maybe in, in more than one. Would you bow your heads now and pray with me? Father, we're mindful today that we are thankful for our parents, we're thankful for our children, we're thankful for our spouses, for our friends, and we're thankful also for people who make life really difficult for us, who teach us our own sin by the sin that they manifest. We're thankful for the ability and the challenge to be forgiving and to be graceful. And we would ask, Father, that, that you would teach us in our relationships to be serving you through our sacrificial nature, through our forgiveness, through our affirmation, through the things that we say and do and the way that we respond. Help us show our love for you by the way we love one another. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Be in a prayerful attitude as Alejandra brings uh, brings us back into worship. Who I am. 
I thoroughly enjoyed being with you uh, this morning. It's nice to have worship. We have to have it outside. We have plenty of uh, seating for next week, so make sure you invite a friend to come to worship with you um, next Sunday. And check your email for the exact starting time. We're going to get that right this week. Let's bow our heads for a word of benediction. Father, because you are always the same, always loving, always gracious, always kind, we give thanks and honor and praise to you. And we ask that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you might engender those same characteristics in us, your followers. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.